Hello, I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Today we will be talking to Greens MP for New South Wales, Abigail Boyd, in relation to the new and increasingly draconian anti-protest laws in New South Wales. Okay, thank you for joining us today, Abigail. Thank you for having me. Now, these laws have brought in potentially two years jail and $22,000 fines for protesters in New South Wales. Um, I am squarely at climate protesters. It seems to give them a different classification under the law to other forms of democratic pro protest. You've been very critical of these laws and in March, you appeared at a protest rally and spoke with David Tubridge and others in relation to these laws. Tell us what that was like. What was the mood in the room and how do you feel? What do you think that day achieved? So that day, when I think back, that was the week when um, just the day before that um, SNAP rally, we had given notice in Parliament that we were going to try and disallow the regulations under the previous um, uh, iteration of the, of the laws um, that would stop. Uh, basically, it was the first time that they had expanded um, the anti-protest legislation to refer to, to a bunch of different roads. So it was kind of the precursor to what they then did later that week. Um, so we were already kind of had our, um, uh, you know, we were on, on alert that something was happening in response to these um, Blockade Australia protests. Uh, so we went across the road to the... Um, to the, uh, to the rally um, where there was a great crowd of passionate people. Uh, and we, while we were there, we got, no, we got news um, from our lower house colleagues uh, in New South Wales Parliament that the Attorney General was about to bring in new laws um, and rush through a new bill um, that would be even, um, I guess, more draconian than what we thought we were fighting. And that's what we now know as these draconian anti-protest laws. So at the rally, we spoke and a number of other people spoke very passionately about um, how the right to protest is a fundamental democratic right. Um, you know, the Liberals seem to think that democracy only happens at elections, but clearly it doesn't. It's supposed to happen every day, all day. Um, and so this, yeah, like I think at that point, we're like, this is extreme. But we had no idea how extreme uh, until we had that debate over the next couple of days in Parliament um, where that bill was rushed through. Um, we filibustered with the help of the Greens, with the help of um, the Animal Justice Party. We filibustered all night on the Thursday and we actually made Parliament sit an extra day on the Friday um, in order for them to pass those really disgusting laws. Okay, now the main change seems to be that the April update includes all metro roads and major facilities such as train stations. Is there any other particular target that took aim at apart from climate protesters? It's hard to see. And, you know, there's, we'll get to, to talk about this a bit later, but, you know, the motivation seems very squarely directed um, at stopping people uh, from the inconvenience of being stuck in traffic because of um, the Blockade Australia experiences, which is extraordinary. Uh, it's an extraordinary um, overreaction. But when we look at the legislation that was passed um, that week in Parliament, rushed through with the help of um, the Labor Party, um, really joining forces with the, the coalition um, to pass it in the most extraordinarily rushed fashion. Um, what those laws did was say that you would be um, guilty of an offence and face that $22,000 fine and um, potential two-year jail sentence, um, even if you were doing something on a road or major facility that just caused somebody to be redirected around you. So not even that you were, not that you were causing harm to people um, or, uh, or damaging property or any of those things, but simply... Or illegally fact. knocking down vast tracts of trees or perhaps illegally <laughs> putting a CSG well on someone's farm or nothing disruptive like that, Mike. No, that's right. Um, simply standing and having a police officer or someone else having to say to a passing pedestrian, you will need to now walk around, that would have been caught by the Act. This is how draconian it was. Um, now, the Act prescribed, basically it said road as a defined term and major facility as a defined term um, to be defined in regulation that nobody had seen at that point. Um, so effectively gave the Minister for Metropolitan Roads and the Attorney General the power to define anything they liked 
as a road or as a major facility. And so by the end of that week, we had got these two regulations, as soon as the, the bill was passed, we had these two regulations proclaimed uh, without any parliamentary oversight by these ministers. The roads one basically says that road means any road across the state, um, not just the Harbour Bridge and major thoroughfares, but you know the road outside my house um, is now prescribed. So if you if you were to gather there and someone was forced to push you around to get around, um, you could be caught. Um, now, presumably, this is being policed by the same New South Wales police that we now have to get a permit from to have what was previously a democratic peaceful protest. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So the, you now need to have a state sanctioned protest, um, which means instead of just notifying the police, um, you have to actually get explicit approval. Um, so the other thing they did was to say that a major facility, which had been interpreted during the debate as being maybe a ports facility or a, you know, something of that nature, um, is pretty much every train station um, in metropolitan Sydney. So Town Hall, um, Martin Place, any of those things. Um, if you want to now organise a protest or a rally at Town Hall, you need to, in order to get that police approval, um, you need to follow a whole bunch of conditions that they are seeming to make up on the spot. So you essentially can't get your message out anywhere other than through Rupert Murdoch. Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, that's right. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the message that, um, that Rupert Murdoch is putting out is that these, these protesters are somehow um, violent uh, and um, unprincipled or paid. That's the other one that they love to say, paid protesters. Ah, uh, the old ranger crowd have heard that. Yeah. Time, yeah. <laughs> now, last Wednesday, the New South Wales Upper House passed your call for papers, is that correct? Calling on the government to release all the internal documents regarding the operation and creation of these laws. Is that correct? Tell us about that process. How does it operate? And where does it all go from here? So the process of getting it, so there's a thing called a, an SO52, it's just Standing Order 52, which is where we, we in the upper house as the house of review um, and not being government um, controlled like the lower house is, we can do this thing that's called a call for papers where we receive, we, we specify what we want to see and then to the extent that it sits within any minister's or department's office, um, they are legally obliged to give it over to us. Um, now, we are expecting um, a whole bunch of different types of documents, but what I'm hoping to see um, are things like the text messages where the MPs were texting each other saying, I'm stuck in traffic, in traffic isn't this inconvenient? Um, but also the fact that um, it, you know, it appears that there was no legal advice taken on, um, on these laws, that they were drafted in an awful hurry. Um, we believe that they're not going to stand up to constitutional scrutiny uh, if they go to the High Court. Uh, so I think seeing, being able to to prove that the government um, really rushed the laws through um, in an irresponsible way would be quite useful. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what comes out of those papers. But in terms of where to from here, we have tried to disallow the regulations in whole, but Labor again sort of ganged up with the government um, to defeat that. Um, and when we come back in August in the first sitting week, we're going to try again um, to at least carve out from the regulations those major um, Sydney uh, rally spots like Town Hall, Mountain Place, um, from the operation uh, of, the, of the regulations. Um, so fingers crossed. Hopefully we'll, um, we'll have, you know, managed to change Labor's minds by then. Okay, the, look, the last election was a nationwide rebuke of climate denial. The New South Wales government seems determined to remain locked into an ideological climate denial war that they can no longer win. Governments in general, and state captured governments in particular, are always happy to use police resources for anyone that wants to protest against them. But this really does take it to a whole new level, doesn't it? And, and you seem to be thinking that we may have to keep these laws yet narrow them down and somehow um, improve yeah. on the definitions. Is it your view to get rid of them completely or simply to chip away until they cease to be effective? We absolutely have to get rid of them entirely and we won't rest until we've 
until, <laughs> until we've done that. Um, but in the meantime, I think the impact on um, broader society in relation to protest um, has been quite chilling and will continue to be chilling. When you look at the, the impact, not just that these laws have had on police and that sort of empowerment that they have um, felt with these laws, that they can go and do a whole bunch of things, um, with the strike force that has been established to, um, to get to these protest groups before they've even protested. Um, when you look at that sort of military, sort of militarised style of police enforcement um, and the message that sends to people in, the broad, in broader society about what these climate protesters are doing, um, compared to when you look at climate protesters and, you know, the very, very peaceful ways in which they are actually protesting. There's this real disconnect. But when that's then put into the media and when politicians use words like terrorists and, um, you know, climate criminals and cli those kind of rubbish sort of statements about these protesters, um, I worry that that's the kind of thing that then leads people to, for example, drive their car into a group of protesters to think that's okay to exercise violence themselves um, against people who are going about their business. So I think the cultural effect of that real sort of um, militarized uh, quashing of dissent um, is just terrifying. And I think that's, that's something that we all need to be fighting back against. Given what everything in New South Wales is wrestling with a lot of these cultural issues right now, they seem to be a rogue state in a sense. They're a bit like Texas. They're determined to legislate us back into the 18th century, no matter how much the general public and large numbers of people protest against it. How long do you think this is going to last? How much longer can they really hold out? Bearing in mind that Perite's got an election coming up in March mm. next year. He must be bleeding by now, surely. Well, this is... And again, this comes back to your previous question about what did they learn from the federal election? You know, did they learn that climate was actually um, something that people prioritise in their vote? Um, they should have learned that. But not only have the government in New South Wales not learned that, I don't think Labor have learned that. And to me, that's my biggest concern right now. This was an absolute gimme for the for the Labor Party. When these laws were, were introduced, this was a real chance for Labor to say, look, we know it's inconvenient, but so is climate change. We hear the federal election result. We will stand firm. Um, and we would take this on as some, um, you know, sign that we are going to back uh, strong action on climate. That, that was a real gimme for them to distinguish themselves from the libs, and they didn't do it. Um, and all the time that you have Labor and Liberal marching in lockstep together on this stuff, um, it's just, it's pointless. Um, so we sit in the middle and try and keep them all honest and try and, you know, push them to be better. And so I, I really do worry, and I think the only uh, hope I have is the fact that I think the that voters have woken up to voting for someone other than the major parties. Given that New South Wales opposition Labor leader Chris Minns was the architect of the so-called Green Energy Friendly Road Energy Roadmap in New South Wales, and given that the Labor Party itself was founded on the blood of protesters and, and people fighting illegal laws and unjust treatment by the police, what justification did Chris Minns give for backing them on these laws? I think Ray Hadley told him to. Um, I think there, oh, seems, yeah. <laughs> there just seems to be on a number of these issues, there seems to be Ray Hadley gets both of them on, gets Parate on, he gets Mins on. Uh, we saw it with the bail laws. We've seen it with um, some of the, uh, the stuff around um, workers striking. Um, and as soon as Labor feels that the right-wing media might have a go at them, they seem to be buckling. Um, it's extraordinary that they would abandon, I mean, two weeks ago, they, they voted against um, a bill that would have lifted the wages cap. This is Labor. Um, yeah, I don't crazy. know if they've been in the kind of in opposition for so long that they've, they're so scared to have a, you know, any kind of policy, but this is, we need them to actually support workers and support climate and support protests. Like, it's just, I don't know what's happened with them. Um, and I, 
I'm sick of saying I'm disappointed. I want them to be better. Now, mm. just before we finish, I'd like to ask you about how people can help this campaign. What the average citizen in New South Wales is struggling to pay the mortgage, get to work, pay the tolls, run the gold to public transport in lousy weather. What can they do to help stop us backsliding into a police state? What can we do to help you get these laws rescinded? So I guess a couple of things. Firstly, um, if you go to my website, abigailboyd.org, you'll see we've got a campaign um, where you can click a, a link and it goes through um, to email the, the major parties in New South Wales to, to urge them to um, rewind these laws and to reverse these laws. Um, but also go and talk to your neighbours. Talk to you know, there's all of this right-wing nonsense um, that's permeating through the media at the moment about what these climate activists are doing. Um, talk to the talk to other people. Let them know how fundamental the right to protest is and how our democratic rights are under threat in New South Wales. Um, talk to your Labor MP if you've got a local Labor MP and I demand that they do better. Um, these are the things that you can be doing. Um, but if you time poor, which so many of us are, um, the first thing to do would be to go to that to my website and um, click on that ready-made email for you. Um, it gives me great pleasure when the uh, the other parties come and tell me that they're getting, you know, hundreds of emails on these issues. <laughs> can I stop, please? I said, no, I can't. Um, so, yeah, that would be great. But spread the information. This is This is important. So what's the next step for you now? You're hoping to get hold of the papers for some transparency and you can decide then which areas of um, weak administration that it reveals that you can target. Is that the plan? Yeah, so I'm, I'm waiting to see what was in there in terms of their kind of real motivation. But also what we'll get from there is some information about what has been told to the police in terms of the operational aspects of the law. Um, that I'm very interested in. Um, then we'll be moving to disallow those um, sort of you know, the usual protest spots in Sydney, hoping to at least get that through um, in August. Um, but also there will be a high court case. Um, so we know that that's something that's going to happen. Um, we've been um, working with a number of um, public interest lawyers on that aspect of things. Um, I would expect from my rudimentary knowledge of constitutional law that this is not a, a valid um this, this law is not valid constitutionally because it does exclude certain types of protest. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it'll be very interesting. And if it gets struck down by the High Court, um, that would be fantastic. And then we can, uh, yeah, we won't have the laws anymore. So. And it is going to get awkward for Chris Mintz. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That was New South Wales Greens MP Abigail Boyd updating us on the New South Wales anti-protest laws, which are hoping to have struck down with further action in New South Wales Parliament in August. This is Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us.